Hello everyone, my name is Marvin Otieno and I'm currently the founder of Planetary Health Eastern African Hub. I would like to give you a brief introduction about our hub. It actually offers an opportunity to learn and share about planetary health and uh, the planetary health emergency in the Eastern Africa. We actually aim at stimulating the regional community building, provide education for transformative action and also push for strategic policy making in the face of the greatest um, planetary health emergency of our time. So um, today we'll be having our third lecture as just Laura had mentioned for transformative paths for planetary health in the Eastern Africa. And we'll uh, start with uh, the founder of uh, Women Leaders for Planetary Health, um, Dr. Nicole De Paula, who will be the first presenter for our today's session. All right, so I can just, um start here. Thank you so much, Melvin and Laura, for the invitation. It's a true pleasure to be with you all here and seeing how the hub is growing. And uh, it's a true partnership. I'm very thankful for that. All right. Thank you so much. Um, it's um, Today, uh, our topic is really about transformation. So I thought that we are bringing the topic planetary health in the context of inequalities. Um, if you're following this course, right, you really know a little bit at the point uh, of the planetary health narrative. And so I like to start saying that today is the best day to be alive. Uh, you've seen so many uh, previous lectures talking about how human population is healthier than ever before. You have life expectancy, reduction of poverty, uh, reduction of child mortality. Uh, of course, this progress has been uneven, but yet we are in our, let's say, best times. However, the reason we are convening here today is that uh, obviously it could be considered um, the worst time to be alive. And this is because of this uh, massive footprint that we are having on our um, uh, planet. And this uh, picture on the left here, we definitely, that's not something, a good uh, sign that we are heading in the right direction. And what are we doing to our planet is definitely coming back to us. Um, so we, you've learned how to achieve this success. Um, um, we have been using massively our uh, natural capital. Um, what the problem with that is that we are measuring our success with the GDP and perhaps that's obviously something that we know that is not our best of choice because it really fails to account what a nation loses its economy grows. And that's something that I'm sure you had in the context of this club. So I really like that if Earth is getting hotter than our imaginary boyfriends, uh, it's definitely time to act. However, what is interesting about uh, planetary health it's really we have to go uh, beyond this, the climate change narrative only. We really want to tackle this problem in a holistic, systemic way, right? So climate change uh, is probably also reinforcing and re-emphasizing uh, everything that is happening around us. Uh, we uh, cannot forget a biodiversity crisis, this pollution crisis, uh, but we are focusing today on this idea of this mediating factors. I really like this picture here because it's about our culture, our behavior, uh, the way uh, we use technology and the values behind that is about um, governance, leadership. Um, what is interesting, of course, in 2015, we had the creation of this um, massive universal roadmap for development, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and the problem is COVID-19 now is really um, putting another uh, barrier for the achievement of the SDGs. If we're seeing how we are evolving into that, we were already not even before COVID, we're not really doing so well. And this report, this Inclusive Wealth Report 2018, it's, it's a quite interesting. It gives uh, concrete examples of uh, which countries are doing uh, what. And what they find out is that of something that we know, but it's uh, putting here some number, is that uh, natural capital has declined in 127 countries out of this 140 that were researched, um, even as this global economy grew. So, I like this example. When you treat, for example, a mangrove forest, uh, they treat it as an example of an asset. It's a habitat for fish that we eat. It's a source of timber and it protects people from storms and tsunamis. And of course, we are not seeing enough um, value of this natural capital, which is not only a question of flow, we have through assets being destroyed in an unprecedented rate. So planetary health is a vision 
to multi-solve global challenges in the Anthropocene. We're really talking about human health in this time when human activity can be compared to a geological force altering all our landscapes. So um, with eight, almost 8 billion people uh, on this planet, we don't have the luxury to have each person working here. Oh, for example, you pick your SDG, I do um, poverty reduction, and the other person do, uh, does gender, and the other does climate. No, we really need this collective effort. And what I'm really here to talk about is how this COVID-19 accelerates the urgency to combat gender inequities, which is something that is uh, a topic that I've been um, very passionate about. So since gender um, inequality constitutes one of the history's most persistent and widespread forms of injustice, if you eliminate that, if we solve this problem, there is high chances that it's a real movement towards transformative change. And COVID-19 reinforced this urgency for, um, here I will highlight four main reasons. So we all know now that the majority of health workers on the front lines of this crisis were female. They were there taking care of people who were at will force, putting their lives at risk. Um, at home, those who stayed in, you know, in lockdown, the double burden of care, which now I, I actually would like to think is a triple burden of care. Uh, women are uh, usually the ones because of social norms and, the, and this, there is an expectation that they will be taking care of the kids and of the elderly, of the sick people. So of course now women are with the, you know, gained rights, we're also working. And so there was really a lot, uh, a disproportionate burden. Uh, on women's shoulder. Uh, on the, and the third aspect is that usually uh, with this economic crisis that we are seeing, uh, the um, women tend to have the, the most of the jobs in this informal sector. So um, they were also probably the first to be, uh, to be losing their jobs and, and of course without any revenue. And finally, it's um, a very sad reality that with lockdown, the increase in violence, domestic violence of all types in all countries, not only in Africa or Latin America. So here in Germany, where I'm speaking from, uh, we also observe this phenomenon. But what is um, sad is that with, we do have, it's not only with the COVID-19, we do have evidence from past epidemics that showing uh, this gender-based inequalities and how this affects the, their mental health, their economic status, uh, their um, safety. So for example, in the case of Ebola in, in West Africa in 2014, 2016, uh, women were again uh, more at risk given this predominant role as caregivers. Uh, but the main problem there that is a, a, actually a problem that is systemic, it happens in all sectors that you really look at it, is that um, we, women are excluded from the decision-making table. And in this case of the Ebola in West Africa, some papers showing that when you have only men taking decisions about they're really not, they're gender blind, so you're not taking into consideration other needs. Of, and in this case, the consequence was this diversion of resources uh, of, from uh, reproductive and sexual health, um, giving this money more to the emergency response. So instead of preventing, we are now using resources to um, act and to kind of uh, cope with this fire. Um, my, I am from Brazil. So when we also had the Zika problem in 2015, um, this became more of a, in the media because we were about to host the Olympics. But Brazilian women, um, the most affected were also uh, the people who were living in low income areas to, with don't, uh, they don't have access, access to sexual education, to safe abortion and or uh, any type. And the, with the babies with microcephaly, this was really um, a real problem. So uh, overall, I like this quote here from the, the executive director of the UN Women, when they said overall progress since Beijing, that's the landmark conference um, at the UN uh, who really put human's rights at the level of the uh, um, women's rights at the level of human rights uh, has been uh, slow and uneven. Of course, we make progress, but there's still so much to be done. Uh, and here we have some examples. If you, um, of course, women continue to show that this disproportionate share of unpaid care work, as we saw in, this, in the case of uh, COVID and other epidemics, um, but in some developing regions, we have 95% of women's in employment is informal, as I mentioned. The consequences, they are paid 24% less than men for the same amount of work. And then if we move here to this point is that at the current pace, 
nothing happens. We'll take another 50 years before we see uh, equal representation of women in politics, which is to me, a, key, a clear um, aspect of this transformation we are trying to look for. But what's, what's very interesting during the COVID-19, uh, um, countries who were led by women seems to be um, uh, doing better. And these are some of the examples here, Germany, Taiwan, New Zealand, Denmark, Finland, Norway, Iceland. So our task is to really make sure that this care economy that we usually uh, maybe uh, um, saved for women, which is obviously something that needs to change, but as well as this green finance that we are using to recover uh, during this pandemic time, that we take this, in, uh, this gender dimensions into consideration. So um, one of the interesting questions is, is uh, are the societies who are electing women uh, more ready uh, for uh, tackling uh, planetary health issues? They're more open for it? Or are women just better leaders? That's the question. So if you have this quote here from a former Ireland president, Mary Robinson, where she said, if women had equal power in the world today, I believe we would have a very different problem solving way of dealing with the challenges we face. That's a question uh, for you. We can certainly debate that. Uh, but three main points here is that gender is a determinant of health. There is gender blind spots in global health governance, as we can see in the case, how we respond to uh, uh, health emergencies. And these responses must adequately address the social economic options and reevaluate women's choices. Choices because, of course, in this uh, very low income areas, um, women, they don't necessarily have choices. Um, uh, in times of COVID-19, I do think that more we are seeing a, a lot of a, it's a tragic moment we are living. However, it gives us this chance to rethink the rules of reality uh, and planetary health narrative. I think you recognize that these key solutions to a healthy life and more resilient societies, they are not only and necessarily inside the hospital. We need this functional democracies. We need leaders accountability and we need partnerships. Nobody wants to do this job alone. Uh, in, in the specific case of gender, solutions um, uh, that I see as moving forward is you really need to show this interlinkage. What's the connection between gender equality, sustainability, and human health? How do they really together help us to implement the UN SDGs? And also having a longer vision until maybe 2050, to, um, 2100. We do need to train women, especially in the global south, to lead the planetary health solutions, not only to care about the planetary health solutions, but they need to be really leading that. Uh, also in the upcoming academic opportunities in this field, and we connecting to this, we definitely need to ensure self-sufficiency and leadership skills of women for this transformation. Um, this graph, the point is that uh, it's about effectiveness, it's about accountability, but above all, this transformation will only happen if you have in inclusiveness. That's truly important. And I tend to see, uh, I tend to think that in so many events that we participate, usually this gender dimension is something on the side, is a nice thing to have. But if you see in this logic, it's truly uh, essential. So because I, I truly believe in this topic and more out of necessity, I'm not a, uh, I, my background is in international relations. I've been working with international politics for more than a decade. And you do see how women are missing in this key uh, decision tables. And I have founded the Women Leaders for Planetary Health, which is a social enterprise uh, based in Germany, but acting in the global south. And our mission is to bridge these gaps between the environment and health policies uh, through through gender solutions, because we really see gender solutions as a way, as a tool to advance planetary health uh, policies. So we need to make this invisible visible in policy making. If you're interested in the story, we were found, we created this um, uh, as a movement. We started uh, the UN Climate Summit in December 2019. This is a picture of our discussion. It was not a side event. It was really a truly collective, co-creative process at ISS. Uh, where I'm also a fellow here in Germany. Um, and we, I have wrote this blog uh, here. Uh, you can find Women Leaders in Global Health 2019, Powerful Lessons from Kigali. Uh, when I was uh, 
in, in Rwanda last year. It was really interesting to see how these women here in the center being trusted by the community. She's really taking care of the water in this village. This is around the Volcanoes National Park. And it was uh, fascinating. It's a, to me, it's a very emblematic example of planetary health. When you have the mountain gorillas, a very endangered species, uh, the community understood that protecting wildlife, taking care of this forest around there, it's really good for the community. We have to do a win-win situation. Though, so this moment was truly inspiring uh, for me. And now I'm very glad to announce that after a very competitive uh, uh, selection procedure, we have uh, 23 uh, young uh, researchers and practitioners uh, wo uh, working with us in this mentorship um, academy and our digital academy and mentorship program. We have 20 countries from low and middle income countries represented. Uh, and so we are really trying to show that how gender solutions, they need to be, uh, they are cost effective. They really bring this fairness to our uh, societies and they above all address the root causes of unsustainable development. And that's truly important uh, to me. If you would like to know more, there is, of course, you can uh, learn in our website. We are probably gonna have a second version of this next year. So what can we do about it? It's really, um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to pay attention how, uh, of course, end violence against women and girls, uh, but uh, really recognize the value of women's work at home. Uh, and this is not something we can take for granted. We need to encourage women and girls to participate in our political, economic, and public spheres. As they say, if they don't give you a, uh, a space at the table, just bring your own chair and make space and uh, raise your voice. Uh, and of course, we need to have equal rights under the law. There are many countries out there that are still women are perceived as uh, not at the same level legally. So uh, in conclusion, I would like to invite you of course, that to leave no one behind, we have to continue this conversation. Uh, now it is the time to advocate for these bridges, to have different communities together, not only the health practitioner, not only uh, gender advocates, not only scientists. We need to bring everybody together. So we're going to have our first annual summit on the 11th of December. It starts at 1 p.m. Then there is a break and second session at 4 p.m. So we can cover all time zones. Um, and we have very uh, many, many, many important voices there, CEO, scientists, former ministers, ministers, uh, investors, and I really like to have your contribution there. If you'd like to uh, get in touch, please uh, feel free, and I'm very happy to have this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving those, uh, those insights on how to achieve transformational change. And we are continuing with our next speaker who just joined. This is uh, Collins Ongori. Collins is a research scientist at the Kenya Marine and Fishery Research Institute. Perfect. So I give the floor to you to uh, talk a bit about malnutrition in East Africa and the impact of aquaculture on this. Thank you very much. My name is Collins Omori. I'm a research scientist at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute and also a PhD student at uh, St. Andrews University, in Scotland. I'm going to give a talk on malnutrition in East Africa and the impact of aquaculture in Lake Victoria. Borrowing from uh, some of the previous uh, presentations uh, in this forum, I'm looking at uh, the emerging challenges in East Africa, and one of them is insecure food systems, which is also related to biodiversity loss and pollution in some way. So my talk is based on the in insecure food systems that contributes to malnutrition. And so what's malnutrition? According to W Health Organization, uh, it is the deficiencies, excesses, or imbalances in a person's intake of energy and nutrients or nutrients. So it addresses three broad groups of conditions. One is undernutrition. Two, uh, micronutrient-related malnutrition. And uh, lastly, obesity, overweight, and diet-related non-communicable uh, diseases. So that broadly is malnutrition. Uh, so undernutrition in sub-Saharan -Saharan Africa, some statistics here, very interesting. Uh, East, Eastern Africa 
is part of the sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, the cases of undernutrition in this region are 36.7%. Uh, and this compared to Western Africa, which, which stands at 21.4%, Central Africa 32.5%, and Southern Africa 28.1%. Uh, so it shows that the Eastern Africa region uh, is more undernourished. To address the problem of malnutrition, one of the sources of food uh, uh, that offers uh, real benefits to human beings is fish. This is the reason why we should eat, eat fish. Uh, the protein is needed for normal growth and development in children and maintain muscle in everyone's body. Fish is a rich source of vitamins and minerals. Key among these is that fish is high in omega-3 fatty acids, which is very essential for development of the brain and the eyes. It is uh, a requirement that uh, young children and pregnant and lactating mothers eat fish at least once, one serving per week, and then eating fish at least one serving per week has been linked to uh, redu reduction in the risk of heart attack and uh, uh, other uh, non-communicable diseases like stroke. Let us look at the per capita consumption of fish in East Africa. Yes, then I have some uh, more statistics here about the per capita consumption of fish in East, East Africa, which stands at an average of 5.3 kilograms. And this compared to the rest of Africa, which is 10.1 kilograms, is very low. And uh, much lower if you look at the global uh, uh, statistics, which is 19.8 percent. And then again, as the recommended uh, value or level of 20 kilograms. So fish Consumption in East Africa is limited by many things. One of them is cultural beliefs. Uh, there are communities, uh, for example, in Kenya, uh, who still believe today, to date, that fish is uh, some kind of snake and cannot be human food. And uh, the communities that are traditional fish eaters are looked down upon for eating fish. And where they have adopted the culture of eating some fish, there are certain fish that they don't eat. And uh, uh, incidentally, the, the types of fish that are largely avoided are the one that, ones that uh, have greater nutritional benefits. So I have a table here of uh, fish and animal protein consumption across Eastern African countries in 2013, compared to Africa and the globe and the whole, the entire globe. And it, it shows that East Af Eastern African countries are the lowest uh, fish eaters. And uh, uh, then let us look at fish food production from Lake Victoria capture fisheries and aquaculture. There are some elements of this slide that uh, I've lost. I don't know how. Uh, maybe I, they cannot display under this shared screen. But uh, you can see that Lake Victoria, among other lakes of the Eastern African region, the, uh, the Great Lakes of the Eastern Africa, and uh, Lake Victoria is quite prominent there. And uh, the picture down uh, is uh, of a, a fisherman. So that's Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is massive. And uh, it also is really significant in terms of its function, ecosystem function and, uh, and uh, economic uh, uh, strength. And uh, over 70 million people depend on this ecosystem for the ecosystem services. Uh, I would like to say that 
the catch of Lake Victoria, the fish catches are close to 1 million tons for every year, which accounts for 1% of the total inland capture landings, I mean of the, of the world's total landing and 8% of the inland capture fishery. That is according to the Food and Agriculture Organization. This is the fishery of Lake Victoria originally before the current human impact, uh, which uh, would include overfishing, pollution, and many other things that uh, 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 had been alluded to in one of the previous slides. So look at the diverse fauna, fish fauna of Lake Victoria. Um, again, as to this, this is what we have currently. Uh, the dominant fish species are the dagger, uh, biologically rusty Neobola agentia, at 53%. The, it's uh, the silver cyprinid, uh, very tiny fish. And uh, the Nile perch at 26%. And then the tilapia at 7%. Uh, then we also have we have the Caridina nilotica, which is not uh, a fish, uh, but a shellfish. It's not consumed by human beings here locally, but forms a significant part, proportion of the fish, of the catches. Just below the Caridina nilotica, there's no description of that. We have the haplochromines. The haplochromines uh, formed more than 400 species found in Lake Victoria, but the number of species and even the stocks have been diminished by uh, many factors, including overfishing and the introduction of Nile perch. So there's a problem. Uh, production of fish for food is low. Possibly that's the reason why the per capita consumption of fish is also low. So looking at the fish stocks in terms of fish biomass in Lake Victoria, it has been changing over time, but there has been a steady rise since 2005 to date. This data is estimated, is, uh, is obtained using uh, lake-wide acoustic surveys every year. And you can see the, the different fish species performing differently over the time series. Then let us look at the status of aquaculture in Kenya compared to other African countries. Because Africa, uh, I mean, aquaculture has been identified as one of the uh, approaches, uh, key approaches towards addressing uh, scarce and dwindling fish uh, production. So you see Kenya is one of, is the greatest producers of fish through aquaculture compared to other African countries. And uh, aquaculture in Lake Victoria is uh, relatively new. Uh, some industry that has only been here for about five years. And uh, the map before you uh, shows the areas in Lake Victoria, Kenya, where there are cages. And the size of the rings would show the number of cages uh, per establishment. And uh, it shows that most of the cages are located in the open, open waters of the Lake Victoria, Kenya, rather than the Nyanza Gulf. So what is the status of cage culture in Kenya? Um, and also East Africa. I would like to say that there's very little documentation of cage culture development among the other East African countries. But in Kenya, the number of cages has since risen to about 4,000 within. It is also important to note that Lake Victoria is shared between Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And Kenya only has 6% 
of the surface area of the lake. And within the 6%, we have over 000, uh, 4, 000, close to 4,000 cages currently. The statistic I have here is from last year. So they keep growing, and today I believe they are well over 4,000 cages. And uh, the estimated production capacity is 3,180 tons per year of Nile tilapia. The main species of fish uh, grown under cage establishment is, uh, is uh, the Nile tilapia. And uh, this corresponds to the global trends, which you can see displayed uh, in, the, in the time series uh, below by FAO from FAO rather. Now, what are the challenges presented by aquaculture practices? In as much as aquaculture tries to address the gaps in uh, 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 production of fish for human food, it has some serious challenges like water pollution dri driven by unconsumed fish feed. Uh, in cages, Fish are reared in enclosures, uh, which are constructed using metal, sometimes plastic, and uh, a net. Uh, then the fish are fed regularly by treading or uh, pouring some uh, food, which is rich in protein, into the, into the open cage. Uh, not all this feed is eaten by the fish. A good proportion of it is left uh, because it would have, uh, for, for, for the, the uh, first reason why it would not be eaten all, uh, by the time the fish, uh, how do I put it? The feed would sink faster than the fish would eat all of it. Uh, so there are, uh, there are ways by which uh, through research uh, this is being addressed. But uh, over, uh, overall, some fish, some fish feed would still remain within the water, therefore fouling the water. Then one of the, uh, I think the greatest problem with uh, aquaculture generally, and now with cage culture too, is the use of animal protein to formulate feed for fish. The animal protein that would, have, would otherwise be used to as food directly. Like uh, omena, you can read that word. Omena is the same as daga, depending on where, where you live around the lake. It is the silver cyprinid that I showed in one of the previous uh, slides, the small fishes. Mostly, it is caught and sold to factory to formulate chicken feed and now human feed. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, fish feed. Uh, Omena is very rich in micronutrients because it is eaten whole as compared to other fishes where only the, 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 the meat is, uh, forms uh, human food. Uh, so when we use this to process fish feed, then we are rather wasting the food. Why don't we eat the fish the omena fish itself. Uh, so in conclusion, I would say aquaculture contribute, can contribute to alleviation of undernutrition in Eastern Africa by increase, increasing fish production, but it must be done in a sustainable way. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you so much, Collins. We have two questions already that are um that are on clarification from your presentation. So maybe we could uh, do that right now before we continue with the next speaker. So the first question um, is on the water quality in Lake Victoria and how good it is, but also if it has been changing over time and if there are other sources of water pollution than what you have named. Yes, the water quality in Lake Victoria uh, as I said, Lake, Lake Victoria is vast. Uh, there is the Lake Victoria regionally, the, the whole lake, 
And then there is Lake Victoria, Kenya, and the other portions in respect the other countries, and then the Nyanza Gulf. So I would say the water quality in the open waters of Lake Victoria generally is not as bad. But the Nyanza Gulf has been impacted greatly by many uh, uh, factors, uh, including excessive nutrient, uh, um, uh, uh, plant nutrient input from urban catchment, the agricultural catchment. Uh, so the pollution contribution by cage culture may not be significant at the moment compared to other poll pollutant sources, but it is potentially uh, with the, uh, uh, going by the trends uh, of the <clears throat> of the increase in number of cage establishment, it will be a significant contributor to pollution. Thank you. And then we have a second uh, question uh, that is uh, also on the aquaculture. And it is, uh, if you think that it's uh, possible to couple aquaculture with petty rice farming in Eastern Africa, and if so, what type of fish would you recommend? It is possible and it has been tried in Kenya. Uh, they are emerging techniques like uh, aquaponics. Uh, but uh, the reason why they slow uptake is uh, one, uh, the, the, the rice growers prioritize their rice over the fish and the fish growers or fish uh, uh, farmers uh, also, ha I think, have uh, more uh, space for growing fish. The space is not limited yet. So they don't have a reason yet to integrate aquaculture and rice farming, but there's very high potential. And uh, was there a second part to that question? Well, the second part was uh, which fishes are the best yes. to do so? Uh, they are the fish, again, the fish that would be best suited for integration with rice farming uh, is not uh, commercially viable. They are the mud fishes, the, the lung fish and the, the cut fishes. And, uh, when you grow that, then um, uh, it's a fish that largely is used for, for subsistence, for, for consumption at home rather than for commercial, uh, its commercial value. Thank you also for highlighting the need for like integrated uh, approaches where not the one is prioritized over the other, but where we take more holistic approaches uh, in agriculture. There is one last question for you before we continue, and that is, uh, if there is significant difference in the nutritional value between caged fish and wild fish? No significant difference. There are studies that have uh, looked at this and uh, we have found that uh, the nutrient uh, content in these fishes are basically the same. And uh, of course there are uh, social preferences uh, the consumers of Nile tilapia, the native communities, and largely, generally, the Kenyan community prefer Nile, Nile tilapia. And they prefer Nile tilapia for, from Lake Victoria. Again, they would rather have the wild Nile tilapia than the uh, cage grown Nile tilapia within Lake Victoria. Uh, for uh, just because of the mentality that uh, cage cultured fish is artificial. Thank you very much. I think uh, this interest shows us that we definitely should run another session on uh, nutrition as well. So I think what we do right now is that we just collect more questions to all the speakers while we getting another short input by given. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to join and already as introduced, my name is uh, 
Given Monga. I'm a PhD student at the Center for International Health in, in Munich um, uh, for the University of, uh, of Munich, LMU. Um, and just, just to share a few insights from, from my perspective, I think my story would pretty much begin some years back, but I would talk about the beginning of this year, the first quarter of this year, around March, I attended a course in uh, climate change and health and Professor Martin Herman was, was the one leading it. And it was a great um, uh, time um, interacting with other um, players who are equally concerned about the health uh, of, of our planet. And since then, I've been troubled by the idea of how to how we live together on 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 the surface of uh, of the earth and uh since then i i have joined um the 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 eastern african hub and and what troubled me was um being in germany i i've i've interacted with a lot of other um, students and medical practitioners for instance there are groups like fridays for future but I was looking forward to something for, uh, for Africa. So when I heard about the Eastern African hub, uh, Martin mentioned that to me. I was so excited to hear that we could do something uh, from the uh, global South uh, as well, uh, defining our problems and also seeing how we can, we can contribute. Um, just to mention that about now, um, we are about 7.8 billion people on the surface of the earth. And one intriguing thing that I find is that with this population increase, we, we have to learn how to live together. We have to talk to each other and learn how um, to live, uh, live together. And, and also in my, in, my, in my mind, I realize that we are at a point where we can't sleepwalk into the future um, and just carry on with the dreams of the past. I think we need to now be strategic and, and begin to uh, critically think of how we can preserve the planet so that we can live well. With the increase in population, there's increase in technology and, and more consumption and or to sustain this population, but, but also with this increase in, in, in industries and all. And, and then we had a point now that we can just carry on. I think as in collectively, uh, together we have to begin to talk to each other and, and ask difficult questions on how we can continue to advance so that we can produce more and live uh, longer, but also live in a health way so that this planet can still sustain us. Because we we'll get to a point where this planet won't be able to uh, sustain us. And so these are some of the questions that have been troubling me. And I have been excited to be a part um, of the Eastern African Hub. Uh, and I didn't mention my preamble. I originally come from Zambia. And, and I've already to, uh, started to talk to some of my colleagues in the hospitals and all physicians and to see how, from a health point of view, we can as well begin to drive this message, to talk openly and, and interact and see how collectively we can begin to formulate ideas how everything that we do, we have this mind of preserving the planet, but also asking as individuals what we are, uh, we are able to do. I'll, I'll pause there, Laura. You can, you can tell that I have, I have, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite passionate about this and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to join everyone and listen into the wonderful presentations today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Given, um, for joining us today. And I think one question that we have to all the, the speakers is when had your like personal transformational moment has happened? So what motivated you to start the work that you're doing? Sure. Thank you, Laura, for the question. And it's, uh, there are so many dimensions of this. I can uh, talk about my personal experience. How do you want to join? I think planetary health didn't start in my life when I was 20 something, right? But I was observing uh, and circulating the corridors of power. You're seeing how the social roles are being defined. So I'm, I was just observing 
observing, but at that point, you still don't understand these divisions, these uh, invisible uh, barriers uh, to, to, to a, a really just participation. So, but um, the, specifically for me um, and the creation of the Women Leaders of Planetary Health, when I was in this trip in, in Rwanda, I was in a meeting of a, you know, global leadership in, in, the, in the field of global health for women, but nobody there was really talking about uh, leadership with this idea of planetary health in mind. So it was really much business as usual, but with more women at the top. Uh, I found this very uh, narrow uh, and I thought, wait, wait a minute. And, and then the traveling to this really to nature and, and, and circulating and meet with the, uh, with the communities there, talking to really local leaders. And I think as it was mentioning um, um, before here, our last speaker saying it's the idea that the global South needs to define their own uh, priorities and solutions, right? I mean, I think I was also a little bit tired of going to these meeting, uh, meetings in, in Europe, for example, about sustainability and all the solutions that we need to ride more bikes, you know, like as, as if every city was like Denmark, Copenhagen. So seeing this more and more uh, really motivates me to uh, bring um, this idea of planetary health focusing uh, in the global south with this idea of fairness and justice and, and more women in leadership positions. And to be truly transformative, if you ignore this, the, the dimension of the environment that we're really talking about here in connection to health, uh, um, it's, we're not going to go uh, very far. So what I, I'm really passionate about is about uh, connecting the dots, right? Connecting communities. It's bringing, if we keep talking to the same people, we're not going to do any transformation. So I actually enjoy, see, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a gender advocate. And that's exactly what I'm doing now, because you have to enter I think new fields to learn yourself and also to maybe perhaps change a few minds along the way. So we don't need to change the world, but you can change your community. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I have lived around Lake Victoria since I was born and I've witnessed all some of the changes, uh, major changes in the ecosystem and uh, the direct impact on the communities. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to make comparison with other places where the environmental health of the system seem to have been preserved. And uh, therefore, the concern is how can we work to restore our systems? Lake Victoria is just a, one case. There are so many other uh, similar, similarly impacted aquatic systems and also communities living around uh, those systems, especially water bodies where they try to draw uh, uh, ecosystem services like, like fish. So how can we uh, try to restore those systems uh, back to uh, uh, good uh, environmental uh, health status. Uh, this is my motivation. And uh, like given, put it, we need to work together. We need to bring all our heads together, bring in more people uh, to share the same concerns. Uh, then, uh, places uh, uh, like here in Kenya, which are seriously impacted and, uh, and, uh, and uh, where resources are really diminishing can be uh, restored. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, maybe given you have like one last insight to share with us. Uh, maybe just with, with respect to your question, um, when my, like this transformation really, <laughs> happened to me. Um, I, I could uh, uh, trace it back to medical school where I, I, I was already aware about the challenges of, I mean, the eminent uh, issues with, with respect to the changing climate uh, and all that. But I think at that level, at that point, I was, I was, I was really engulfed with this feeling of littleness. Like it's, it's, it's a very big problem. And my contribution is really a drop in the in the ocean. It won't make a difference. And I would say this park, uh, what changed my perspective was 
this much interacting in the uh, uh, climate um, change and health costs. I think one thing that came out clearly was, was that we, we didn't need the whole world to act at once, but that few individuals who appreciate the agency of the matter, speaking with the conviction that they have, but also opening up to other players to work together could be the way forward. And then I realized that with my littleness, I could still uh, expend my energies to really speaking about, about this, but also opening up to other players for collaboration. And, or, and, and so I was re-energized um, besides my many years of frustration, looking at how, you know, uh, the one frustration is how you look at maybe the, the political system which should really drive the force is lagging behind and and is is just a global citizen then how much can i change things and but now i realize that as an individual you could make a difference um but also uh, to be open to collaboration so much uh this year really uh, re-energized my passion um and rekindled um my desire to make a difference thank you very much